Okay, so today we're going to talk specifically about interpreting norm reference scores. So this will build upon the lecture on normal distribution and scores on the normal distribution. So, so norm reference scores, let's see, let's remember what that means. So when we're talking about norm reference scores, um, what are norm reference scores? So norm reference scores um, refer to scores that are based upon a comparison to a population or a sample of populations, right? That norm reference group. And that norm reference population is super important when we're interpreting those norm reference scores. Remember that sampling we talked about in the last lecture? And remember these scores are given as a standard score or percentile rank, which is the percent of population that scored equal to or less than that subject. So criterion referenced examples. Oh. So let's look at that norming population sample again. So it's critical to the interpretation. It's clearly defined for the test. Um, so we want to make sure that we're considering things like, um, is it the classroom or grade level of the student, um, the socioeconomic status, um, the race or ethnicity of the student, the geographic um, regions, so south, midwest, east, um, urban and rural areas, the language backgrounds, and the special education status of the students. We want to make sure that the norming population includes the students um, of those types um, and is also representative of the general population. Um, and remember this chart from the last lecture. Again, you want to make sure you have this out and that you, you understand how all of these different scores are related to each other. So score reports. So again, um, in the um, standardized case study assessment that's coming up um, next week that you'll be writing, you'll be thinking about and interpreting the scores. So you might want to go ahead and take a peek at that assignment, take a peek at the case studies that you'll be analyzing and thinking about and making sure that you can interpret each of those scores. So you have a raw score, and remember that you can't interpret a raw score, right? That's the number of students, the number of questions that the student answered correctly, or is hypothesized to answer correctly if you're using something like IRT, like on the um, iReady or the GRE test, those smart tests that are adaptive. Um, and remember, the raw score really isn't useful at all. You cannot interpret a raw score. So you're going to kind of ignore that information. Just know that the raw score is what's used um, in the tables and in the, um, the interpretation. So we use that raw score along with the student's age and grade level to decide what to interpret those um, standardized scores or the other scores on the report. So the psychometricians um, use those raw scores to come up with those derived scores. So the score reports, so we have this scaled or standard score that sometimes we call that the, the deviation IQ score. You should remember this from last week. You can find it on that um, normal curve distribution page that we saw last week. And remember, it's that normalized score. Remember that 100 is the mean and the 15 is the standard deviation. And the nice thing about it is it reports all examinees on the same scale. And we kind of assume that, that on the IQ that this wouldn't change over time, that your, your, standard, your standard score IQ wouldn't change over time. So even though at five you would have gotten more questions right than you did when you were 15, your IQ relative to other people, other five-year-olds versus other 15-year-olds, would stay relatively stable. Um, so again, why would this be useful? Why might you want to report a standard score to other people? Um, psychometricians and other, and people are usually fairly familiar with this, especially in relation to IQ scores. We kind of have this idea about what a 130 or a 115 or a 100 IQ score means, and that's why it might be useful. However, if you're not familiar with these scores, it can be kind of confusing, especially if we're used to thinking about how a 100 is a perfect score on a test. A 100 IQ doesn't mean the same thing. So it can be confusing to parents who aren't as familiar with this scale score. And within that, we also have what we call a standard error of measurement. Remember in the first week of class, we talked about standard error of measurement and how all tests and all measurements have error in them. 
Um, and that's doubly true for educational measurements and especially true for these um, measurements, these standardized measurements um, on these norm scales. And so what we do is we calculate what the standard error of measurement is. And this is the amount of measurement that's likely, that's probable within the test. And we use statistical means to calculate that. It's based upon the reliability, that's the consistency of scores and the standard deviation of scores, that's the distribution of scores. So we have a formula for it, I'm not gonna bore you with the formula for the standard error of measurement, but just know that it's derived from those two things. And basically what it means if the student was able to take this test over and over again under ideal circumstances, that sometimes they would score a little bit higher and sometimes they would score a little bit lower. And this is the theoretical average of those scores, the theoretical amount of how much higher or lower those scores would be. Um, so we use this to create confidence bands. So let's say that, this, that our, the score, the standard score of the student was 102 and um, the 95th percentile and we <laughs> was 90, 92 to 112. Um, that means that the standard error of measurement was um, 10 points. So sometimes it was higher and sometimes it was lower. So 10 points. Um, was the standard error of measurement. So our 95th percentile band, our standard error of measurement refers to the 95th percentile. So I can be 95% confident that the score is somewhere between a 92 and a 112. Um, so if I took the test again, I'm likely to score somewhere between a 92 and a 112, um, which tells us that, that that 102 is a pretty good estimate of the score, but it's not a perfect estimate. But if I took it again, I might get a slightly different score, right? I might happen to get some questions right, or I might happen to get some other questions wrong, right? Um, if I wanted to be 100% sure of a range of scores, I could say I'm 100% sure that I scored somewhere between, you know, a zero and a 200, right? Um, so the higher the confident, the confident I wanna be, the larger the range of scores. If I only wanted to be 80% confident, I could have a much narrower band. I might be 80% confident that the score is somewhere between, you know, um, a 104 and a, one, a 100, right? So the, lar the more confident I want to be, the larger the range of scores is going to be. The less confident I need to be, the smaller the range of scores is going to be. Does that make sense? And remember that the standard error of measurement is used to create the 95th percent confidence band. That 95th percentile is usually kind of the mark that we use in statistics that we usually feel pretty comfortable using. So the standard error of measurement is kind of the amount of error that we would normally predict would be in those scores. And just, we wanna keep that in the back of our heads to remember that that 102, that score that we get on a test isn't, exact it's just an estimate it's what we think is what the kid predicted on that day but knowing that there's error in that test and we'll talk a lot more about error and reliability and validity next week in our module um so remember a z-score um a z distribution and the normal distribution is based upon the standard deviation unit so a z-score is just the standard deviation units ranging from negative four to four and remember, we don't really use this one with parents because, you know, no parent wants to hear that their kid's a negative number. So we traditionally change that to a T-score. First day nine is that whole number. Um, and it's, it groups kids into, into um, you know, one to, one, to, one to nine groups. Um, it's helpful in giving a general estimation of a student's performance, um, but it's less exact, right? Um, and then percentile rank, this is probably the most common way that we, that we um, report uh, norm um, reference scores. And it indicates where scores fall in relation to that norming population. So, a six, so the 65 percentile would mean that a, score, a student scored in the net so higher than 65% of the norming population. Again, we, it's really common to report this to parents. It's only confusing. So if I scored in the 65th percentile, some parents might misinterpret that to mean that this, the student scored, um, got 65% of the questions right, which would kind of be like a D, right? But in fact, the student scored better than 65% of the students, which is maybe above average. So we just want to be really careful when we report that to parents that we're explaining it fully. Um, we also have what we call a scaled growth score. So this is not based upon a normal distribution in the same way. So it's not on that chart that you have um, before you. Um, and this one's really dependent upon the test. 
And um, it's like the development score that you might see on the FCAT of the FSA, and it's really specific to each given test. And what it does is it lets us compare test scores over time. So we can use this scaled or growth score to look at tests over time. So if I took a fourth grade test and then the fifth grade test, I can compare those to see how much a kid grew over time. We don't really use this um, when reporting to parents or to try to report achievement. We really just use it to calculate growth. So it's not really that useful in making diagnosis for students, but it's really helpful to see if our program or our instruction is working. Um, and then we have age and grave equivalent scores. So unfortunately, we see these reported a lot to parents, but they're like the bane of my existence. I think these are so difficult to interpret, but I want you to understand what they mean because I guarantee you that you're gonna hear them as teachers when you're in these IEP meetings. So it's similar to a growth score. It's um, expressed in grade levels or years and months. So an age equivalent score, an AES of 5-6, indicates the child did as well on this test as the average five-year, six-month-old child. So if the child was uh, had just turned five, that means that child did as well on this test um, about six months ahead of his age group. Um, grade equivalents interpreted in the exact same way. So a grade equivalent score of 3-4 would mean that they did as well as the average third grader in their fourth month of school. So if they were a fourth grader, that would mean that that child was below grade level, right? Um, the tricky thing about this is it's on this test. So let's say that I got, I was taking a third grade math test and I scored, and I, I'm in third grade, I took a third grade math test and I scored um, at the, um, as well as a fifth grader on that test. That doesn't mean that I can do fifth grade math. What it means is I can do third grade math as well as a fifth grader can do third grade math. So that's where it's really tricky to interpret. It doesn't really mean what we say it means, right? Um, and that's in contrast to a lot of the fluency tests that you give, that you've been giving in your reading assessment classes. If you're actually giving them a fifth grade book to read, then you are telling them that they can read at a fifth grade level. So you wanna be really careful when you're looking at these age and grade equivalent scores, that you're looking at the level of the test itself when you're telling students, when you're telling students and parents what the kids can and can't do. So these age and grade equivalent scores are only meaningful on that particular test. So just be careful in interpretation of what they mean, um, and you'll be okay. Um, okay. So that's how you interpret um, norm reference scores. Those are kind of the range of the ways in which you might see norm reference scores. And I look forward to seeing your work this week. Bye.